trouble in paradise. Desperate people resort to desperate measures to draw attention to their plight. شرایط اینقدر بحرانیه که از کنترل خارج شده. اینجا هر پنج دقیقه یه نفر میفته تو فوکس. These are the asylum seekers Australia doesn't want. The asylum seeker who arrives in Australia by boat will have no chance of being settled in Australia. They paid thousands to people smugglers to get them to Australia by boat. But Australia has shut the door. It sent them to live in shocking conditions in a detention center on neighboring Papua New Guinea. I just couldn't believe that we were housing anybody in those conditions, let alone human beings. I was placed in situations that I should never have been placed in, and that I saw things that I should never have seen. Merci, Tohubi. Since the camp opened, I've been getting calls from distraught people inside. And why be more high Ravoni that Ferro Tarikam Moj Mizanat? As part of the policy, Australia is forcing the asylum seekers to resettle in Papua New Guinea, one of the poorest and most dangerous countries in the world. And they don't want to be in Papua New Guinea, they want to be in Australia. Madness, totally madness, to resettle people here. Australia's policy has been successful in stopping the boats. But at what cost? Australia makes it almost impossible for journalists to tell this story. But I want to investigate what Australia's tough policy means for the people of Papua New Guinea and to uncover the human cost for the asylum seekers. I'm Fariba Sahrai. Is Australia's tough immigration policy a solution to stop people smugglers or a policy which is breaching human rights? Humiliating and degrading treatment. Excessive force was often used by both expat mental health conditions are rare. All attributing to peaceful protest held the threat to their personal safety added another dimension. I was shocked and distressed to see human beings being held in the manner they are in Manus Island. Australian student Nicole Judge was 22 when she applied for a job in a detention center for asylum seekers. I do not believe asylum seekers to be safe in Papua New Guinea. Nicole was a support worker in the camp for four months and was shocked by what she saw there. She wants the rest of Australia and the world to know about what happened there. I was placed in situations that I should never have been placed in and that I saw things that I should never have seen. I'm criticising the government on their actions. I'm not really thinking about things that other people my age are thinking about. So I, I don't really feel like I can relate to my friends because of that. And it has been really hard. It's been really hard. From now on, any asylum seeker who arrives in Australia by boat will have no chance of being settled in Australia as refugees. In 2013, 400 boats carrying more than 26,000 asylum seekers reached Australian territory. More than 300 people died making the journey. Australia decided to shut the door on asylum seekers arriving by boat. The asylum seekers were coming from countries including Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan and Sri Lanka, paying a fortune to people traffickers to realize their dreams of a new life. The route took them to Indonesia, where they were packed into unsafe boats to try to reach Christmas Island, the nearest Australian territory where they could claim asylum. 
استرالیا had long seen neighbor Papua New Guinea as part of a wider Pacific solution to the problem and in July 2013 struck a new deal. Asylum seekers taken to Christmas Island will be sent to Manus and elsewhere in Papua New Guinea for assessment of their refugee status. If they are found to be genuine refugees, they will be resettled in Papua New Guinea. In exchange for aid, Australia would send asylum seekers to centres on the Papua New Guinea island of Manus and also to Nauru. If found to be refugees, they would resettle there. Australia was effectively exporting the problem. We believe strongly that uh, genuine refugees uh, can be able to be resettled in our country and within the region in the years to come. As a journalist who left Iran to start a new life in Canada, I have taken a strong interest in the stories of asylum seekers. Over the years, many Iranians have contacted me to share their experiences. Now I'm getting calls from people inside the detention center in Papua New Guinea. Hearing their stories of desperation made me determined to go to Papua New Guinea to investigate the real impact of the Australian policy, not only on asylum seekers, but also on the people of PNG. Papua New Guinea is a former Australian colony just 150 kilometers from mainland Australia. It is a breathtakingly beautiful country and the people were very friendly to me. But there is another side too. The capital Port Moresby is one of the most dangerous cities in the world. Overseas visitors stay in hotels protected by high security gates. Thank you so much. This is just one example of how tight the security has to be here in Port Moresby. Gun crime, machete attacks and carjacking are a reality of life in this city. I was advised to always travel with locals and never go out after dark. Even at the local market, security guards offered us protection. We were told we were the first foreigners to visit there. How much is this? One? Thank you. Beautiful, but one survey placed Port Moresby as one of the worst places to live in the world, just above the capitals of Syria and Bangladesh. The same survey placed Australian cities among the best places to live. Alex Rini is the editor of the Post Courier one of PNG's main daily newspapers. It's a country that's made up of a thousand different tribes. The uh, Papua New Guineans, a population of about 7.5 million, uh, speak about close to 850 different languages. So uh, we are one of the most linguistically diverse uh, nation on earth. And uh, we are one of the most culturally diverse nations um, in the world. The fact that 85% of Papua New Guineans live in rural Papua New Guinea and uh, they are mainly subsistence farmers, fishermen, fisherwomen. And there's a lot of potential for the agricultural sector to take off, but it hasn't really happened um, yet. 
Australia is basically in a very pivotal position in terms of PNG's history. And um, I see the relationship continuing to grow in strength. And um, in terms of, you know, and the, uh, the Manus Asylum Seekers Center um, is, is another, it's, it's, it's the next step in the relationship that, that Papua New Guinea has reached with Australia. Because Australia had a problem with human smuggling. Um, they basically wanted a solution. And Papua New Guinea gave them that opportunity to reach, you know, to provide a solution. That solution is what drew Nicole to Manus Island in 2013 to start her job at the detention center. I spent 12 hours a day, six days a week inside the compounds. We used to teach English or, you know, have a deck of cards, play cards, chat. And it sounds like a strange sort of job to have. And our job really was just to interact with them, um, monitor their mood, um, report if someone wants, if, if someone's attempted suicide or talked about suicide. Um, yeah, just be friendly. Australia was also sending contractors to Manus Island. One of these was security expert Martin Appleby. His job was to train local men to become guards at the detention centre. I knew of Papua New Guinea and, uh, and what that country was about. I saw that as a very good destination to go to, um, up there uh, just short of the equator and I think the, the sun and the surf, so to speak, would be a good time off whilst up there. So my expectations of the island itself, Manus, did not jump out at all. But those expectations changed when I landed on Manus Island. Omid is 25. He had been a journalist in Iran. He fled over fears of arrest. He made it by boat to Christmas Island, but was sent to Manus in 2013. He has been sending me reports by phone and text of life behind the wire. We've changed his name to protect his identity. فکر می‌کردم استرالیا کشور خیلی خوبیه برای زندگی، مخصوصاً برای پناهجوها. تنها راه رفتن من همین با کمک قاچاقچی‌ها بود که می‌شناختم. ولی به جای استرالیا از اینجا سر در آوردم. استرالیا با تصمیم بگیره که با ما چیکار می‌خواد بکنه. I knew cameras and journalists were not allowed inside the camp. Despite the restrictions, I still wanted to travel to Manus. The Australian government could not have chosen a more remote location for a detention center. It's inside a former Australian naval base, one hour and 20 minutes by air from Port Moresby. On the flight, I sat near to security staff from the detention center who were suspicious about why I would want to film on Manus. At the airport, they photographed us. They thought secretly and also wrote down our car registration number. This wasn't going to be a comfortable stay. Manus Island is small and rugged, with thick jungle, hills, and a beautiful coastline. The population of around 50,000 is mostly rural and predominantly Christian. The main town, Lorengau, has one bank, one small supermarket, and a traditional market. But when Nicole and Martin arrived at the camp, any hopes of a rewarding job in a Pacific paradise were quickly dashed. I was horrified. I was absolutely horrified. 
Manus Island had an instant sense of imprisonment. There was high fences, they were padlocked behind gates. When I walked down the first five minutes, the asylum seekers started shaking the fence and calling out for help. And it just felt like very jail-like and very degrading. And then you've, to add on to that, you've got the stench of feces and it's unbearably hot. There's mosquitoes, you're sweating. I remember so clearly looking to my colleagues and just, just looking and shaking our heads and just saying, why are we here? My first impression was, oh my God, we walked into the camp and there was, there was nothing but World War II tin huts, tents that they were cooking out of, and nothing of a modern era to work under or work with. You can see the stress in their faces and hear it in their voices. So the first week was quite horrendous. It was open dining and as we found out quite quickly it's quite torrential up there so the rains come and go is very very quickly and very very heavy um, so one minute you might be dining dry and the next minute you might be dining wet so very very um, antiquated. For Omid the camp was already a living nightmare. Due to the tight security around the camp, our local guide suggested taking a boat to see it. I headed out along the coast, just as a tropical thunderstorm was brewing. The area is patrolled by naval security boats. We are very close to the detention center now. We have to be very careful as we are going to go past it. The locals say each day is another day in paradise. But for more than a thousand asylum seekers here, it's another day in a detention center facing uncertainty. The camp is run by Australia at a cost of nearly half a billion US dollars a year. Some Manus Islanders are benefiting directly from this spending, working at the detention center as cleaners, caterers, and security guards. Islanders also benefit from Australian aid designed to develop Manus. But there is criticism that building and construction contracts are going to Australian rather than local companies. The Islanders call it boomerang aid. Alan Pomat is the boss of a local construction company. Do you think Manus Islanders are getting enough benefits from the detention center? I don't think so. I think I'm the only local guy to get work here. Electrical work, the plumbing, the um, logistics, all this are given back to Australian company. So that's why I, I mean, I for one, I think that uh, we Manus Islanders are not getting enough. That's about a billion kina uh, money coming into Manus every year and the bulk of money is going back to Australia. During my time on Manus, I did see evidence of how aid was being spent. This is just one example of how Australian investment is changing people's life here in Manus. This traditional local market is soon being transferred 
to a brand new market down the road, which is being built with Australian aid money. People I spoke to in the market blamed the asylum center for a rise in the cost of living, but welcomed job opportunities. I'm very happy, but at the same time, I want to see the spin of benefit for the people of Manos. They could laugh uh, all kind look look where all outside uh, country come in me long uh, Manos. You could laugh, but problem long you me now long here and depend long on some money go pass like you me yeah. as a uh, all some old leader. He come out and explain him when I'm something where people belong. Manusi must understand him when I'm because I'm nubla. I think the program itself is very good for Manus. Basically, the project has created a lot of employment and uh, we have seen a small spin off. It's good for the island. We like it for, uh, for our benefit. Uh, the one we don't have a. Um, uh, Castro production or uh, revenue for Manus, but this one, when, when we have asylum seekers in Manus, we have development. We have money coming in, money flowing to Manus. I also wanted an official view from the Manus authorities. We've just had a phone call from the governor's office saying he's willing to talk to us. I'm just on my way to meet him. Charlie Benjamin is the governor of Manus and also an MP. We met in the sweeping grounds of the former Australian governor's residence, used to administer the island before PNG gained independence. What do you think about the detention center being on your island? Being a member of the current government, Manus have been asked uh, to able to implement it on behalf of the government of, the, of Papua New Guinea. So we have done that. Uh, but uh, my personal uh, opinion is that it is not right. Does the detention center bring any benefit to the community here? Maybe my expectation is too high, but I think that uh, in terms of we helping the Australians by sacrificing even our credibility, it's the type of assistance they're giving us enough as to compare to what we're doing for them. Uh, I don't think so. Manus is one of the peaceful provinces in the country, but uh, with this uh, program that is now here, social problems are happening. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, police people coming here, the rights courts, intimidating people, uh, prostitution is happening. Um, I think the social problems probably outweigh the advantages that is happening right now. The governor made a request for me to go to the detention center, but even the man in charge of the island couldn't get me in. Inside the camp, towards the end of 2013, conditions were deteriorating. A facility meant for 500 people was now coping with more than a thousand young men. My opinion of the detention centre was that it's totally degrading and humiliating. They didn't have toilet paper. We had cases of malaria, we had cases of typhoid, um, mental health conditions. The sense of imprisonment in small confined spaces with hundreds of men yeah, really added to the whole thing. I saw quite a few times men attempt suicide, self-harm. Um, sometimes men would just scream, just sit down and yell or scream or cry. یک جوان پاکستانی در حمام خودش را حلق آویز کرده بود. با ملحفه که شش ماهی میشد کسیان را عوض نکرده بود. رنج بی اندازه و ترس مفرد. هنگامی که به بالای سرش رسیدن رنگ پریده بود و بیهوش پننده ها وحشت زده او را بالای دستشان گرفتن و به سمت در اصلی کم بردن گویی در جنگ کشته شده و همرزمانش جنازهش را به پشت جفه انتقال میدن 
I'd seen asylum seekers being beaten by guards. Overall, I think asylum seekers were humiliated every day by staff. We'd have comments like, well, I don't like him anyway, you know, he's Muslim. You know, we just have a lot of stereotyping, a lot of racism, a lot of ill treatment. They were just on a pure concrete floor with tin and some 120 persons slept in those huts. Their air conditioning consisted of four pedestal fans and that was that. It was, I just couldn't believe that we were housing anybody in those conditions, let alone human beings, quite honestly. It was just horrendous, absolutely horrendous. I was there to do a job. I'm good at what I do, but in here I've got a conscience as well. And to treat another person like we were treating them really pulled me apart. تو ایران سرواز زندان بوده یه سیم فرنسا کن داغش کرد تا سرخ سرخ شد بعد فرو کرد تو دندونم پشمندش هم یه سیگار کامل خاموش کرد تو سوراخش میگفت از زندونیا تو ایران یاد گرفته Things went from bad to worse when the asylum seekers realized they had no hope of being resettled in Australia. It came to a point when the asylum seekers were told that they were never going to reach the shores of Australia. The tensions from that day rose. The open communication that we did have started to, to fall apart and break down. We, as officers, were then seen to be part of the Australian government and were treated as such. You started to find weapons in the tents, in the accommodation areas, and they might have been broken bars off a, a bunk or a bed. When you start discovering small caches of weapons like that, you know there's an underlying apparent issue there. You know something's happened. Shortly afterwards, Nicole and Martin both returned home to Australia. In February 2014, a protest by some detainees rapidly escalated into a violent confrontation involving asylum seekers, guards and locals who broke into the camp. The first I knew about the violence was when asylum seekers began calling me in the middle of the night, pleading for help. A whole range of things put together in a boiling point and that it, it exploded. One of the Iranians in the detention center that night was Reza Berati, known in the camp as the Gentle Giant. His family were poor and his father had sold the family farm to pay for Reza to get to Australia. Reza planned to send money back to support his family Hossein was Reza's best friend and traveled with him from Iran. I got a call saying now they're shooting at us. And what are we supposed to do? And how do we defend ourselves? Are we supposed to fight them back? I told them, and I have messages, that they should stay inside their library and block the door with shelving. That's the only thing that I could do. I don't know what they could have done. It was horrible, really horrible, yeah. I don't know what they could have done to help themselves. 
شما موقعی که فیلم وحشتناک چنین ما میکنید تو کار تلویزیون چیزی که دیگه فیلم وحشتناک ما میکنید من نگاه فیلم وحشتناک ما میکردم اما تو خود فیلم وحشتناک بودم واقعیتی موقعی که یه رفیق رو دارن با چوب محکم دارن تو حیات دارن میزنن اونم چی اونم مثلا یه آدمای قدیری که اصلا نمیشناسی کی هست شما فکر کن یکی به کمکت نیاز داره اما تو باعث میشه که اگه شما خودت میدونی که اگه بیری بیرون اون اتفاقا واسه خودت میفته بعد نمیتونی کاری کنی میخوای داری کمک رفیقت کنی نمیتونی بری کمک چیکو کنی از ترس میخکوب میشی دیگه من بعض وقتی که مثلا ماها بیدار بودیم تا صبح بیدار بودیم بعضی بچه‌ها جیغ میزنن تو خواب یعنی واقعا کابوس میدیدن من خودم خیلی کابوس دیدم واقعیت More than 70 asylum seekers were injured in the violence, including one who was shot and another who was blinded in one eye. Extremely unfortunate for a young man to lose his life and so many injured. It really was. Um, but I suppose the warning signs were there. Um, I know I was very vocal about telling them this was going to happen. So I wasn't surprised it did happen, but I was very sad to hear that it did. Two local men have been charged with Reza's murder. His body was flown back to Iran and buried in his home village where his family are still grief-stricken. The news of a death is a great tragedy and our sympathies are extended uh, to the transferees of that person's family and uh, friends who were, would have been in the facility as well. A cross-party parliamentary inquiry found that the government failed in its duty to protect asylum seekers from harm and that the events were eminently foreseeable. It cited massive overcrowding an insecure facility and long delays processing refugee claims as the main causes for the violence. The inquiry recommended an upgrade to facilities and improved training. I decided to have one last go at getting close to the detention center. I would have to get through a security checkpoint because I knew the security staff had my car registration number. I changed vehicles and the local driver smuggled me through. I got through the perimeter checkpoint. There were still plenty of guards. The security company has changed since the violence. I could soon see accommodation blocks and I caught my first glimpse of some of the asylum seekers there was a new higher security main gate. There was clean water brought in from Australia. The fences are higher, not just to keep the asylum seekers in, but also the locals out. There are floodlights for nighttime security. There is lots of building work going on. And there were asylum seekers outside the high security area playing football. One of the current staff at the detention center told me more about the changes at the camp, on condition we hid his identity. 
They eat three times a day, good food. Now, they come out and walk around the camp. Just for an hour or so, they even play football. Now, when you look at the camp, there is a new fence. So, it looks like we are keeping prisoners in there. الان داشتم به این فکر میکردم زندون زندونمون با وجود این فنسه که کشیدن شاید قشم میتونه باشه تصور کن یک قفص بزرگ و واقعی توی دور ترین جزیره دنیا که یه طرفش با اویانوس میخوره و یه طرفش به جنگل انبو و درخت های بلند نارگیر که اطرافش شد ما حالا مطمئنم زندون ما قشم ترین زندون دنیا I feel real bad. They want to live like a normal man. I don't believe they should live like that. But in spite of some improvements in conditions, in 2015 there were more protests. We are all asylum seekers on Manus Island. Please tell someone to come and help us in here. Fears over being forced to make their new life on PNG led to desperate acts. Detainees staged a two-week mass hunger strike. شرایط اینقدر بحرانیه که کنترل خارج شده. اینجا هر پنج دقیقه یه نفر میفته تو فوکس. Some asylum seekers sewed their lips together and others swallowed razor blades. Australia defends its tough line on asylum seekers arriving by boat by saying it is saving lives at sea. All the asylum seekers at Manus were intercepted leaving by boat from Indonesia. Many others drowned making the journey. I went to Indonesia to understand the risks people had been taking. It was here that I met 11-year-old army. He saw his whole family drown while trying to reach Australia. چرا کار زندگی کنم خوب بود ولی عمه بهارم عمه بهارم گفتش اینجا خیلی بهتره همه چی واسهتون فراهمه میتونید بیاید یه دو سال طول کشید تا ما کل پول اونو جمع کردیم اون دوازده هزار تا نزدیک سال بودی صد متری سال بودی یه موچه خیلی قوی با تمام قدرت ما رو پرد کردیم و کشم از وسط دونست شد اومد بند لباس رو باز کرد من رو برد بالا که مرد سرش خود به میخ سر خود به میخ رفت زیرا He held on to the wreckage not knowing he was already an orphan همهش تو خوابا میان زیاد یادم نمیان ولی مانم میگه one hundred people were on Armin's boat. More than half drowned. Armin's family had sold their flat in Iran to pay people smugglers to get them to Australia. Traffickers are making huge profits from this trade in dreams of a new life. The Australians say their policy is designed to stop this. Inside one of the detention centers in Indonesia, one Afghan man told me what the traffickers did for him. ما خودم شخصا این دوستان آمدم از این دوستان آمدم کامبوج از کامبوج رفتم تایلند از تایلند زمینی رفتم در مالیزیا از مالیزیا در اندونیزیا استرالیا هم میخواستیم بریم قایق ما در طوفان گیر شد 12 سال در بین بحر بودیم ما 
از دوازده هزار تا پانزده هزار دلار میتونه From the 400 boats which arrived in 2013, the number dropped to just one boat in 2014. 15 boats were intercepted and turned back by the Australian Navy. The Australian government says this is evidence the trade in people smuggling is being stamped out. Back on Manus, the first group of asylum seekers have been granted temporary refugee status and are moving out of the detention center. This is the next stage in the Australian plan. But many question the wisdom of resettling more than a thousand young men and perhaps later their families into the local community. I think the program initially started off from Australia, which tried to deter the boat people to come to Australia, the land of maybe honey and milk, as they say. But the successive Australian governments have decided to bring the processing centers out of Australia, which is a good idea for them, but it's not good for Papua New Guinea. We never thought resettlement was in the agenda. We thought that we will um, house the asylum seekers. They can be processed and then be um, allocated another third country. I mean, I think it's madness, totally madness, to resettle people here. The refugees are moving to a new purpose-built accommodation block, costing more than 100 million US dollars. The apartments have modern facilities and are much better equipped than the homes of most islanders. Some local people told me they resented this. We've come to see a typical village on Manus Island. The owner has invited us to come and see their house. Almost 90% of the population live in houses like these. I'm going to see the kitchen now, which is in a separate building. Okay, here is the storage area and uh, here is the food down there. As there is no electricity in most villages, this is the cooker and here is the fuel. Much of their food is caught in the wild. This animal will feed the whole family. PNG has many challenges in terms of poverty, health and education. Critics of the resettlement policy claim the country is not ready to accept newcomers. And there are concerns about the real cultural differences that need to be overcome. I can never see that occurring at all with any safety concerns for the asylum seeker. Not only on the back of um, the riots that occurred and, and what came out of that, but also that you've got one completely different culture interacting with another completely different culture in a third world situation. با شنیدن خبر اسکان ما در جزیره مانوس برای یک لحظه تمام دنیا رو سرم خراب شد با مردمانی که دندانهایشان همیشه قرمز است تصور کن اینجا باید زندگی کنم باید ماهیگیری یاد بگیرم و بتوانم از درختان بلند نارگیل بالا بروم و زبان پیجین که فقط در این جزیره به کار می رود یاد بگیرم if somebody doesn't want to be settled here and you force him to settle here, definitely there will always be a problem. And I think that was the problem. They don't want to be in Papua New They want to be in Australia. Settling people from another culture, another religion here in Papua New Guinea, it's not easy for us to accept. It's not easy for us to accept. 
In the market, some people shared the governor's reservations. You can find an area where you can settle them all uh, behind, so suppose only got some black kind of thing or some local and local place, all, all can go back in. They will adopt our customs in Manus and they can live with us. Marriage, they can do that. We are human beings. Our lives are very important and we have to live together as one. Everything I've heard here makes me realize there is no easy way forward. Most asylum seekers can't imagine living here. Australia doesn't want them, and there are serious challenges to resettlement on PNG. As long as there are countries which people want to leave, this problem is not going to go away. landmarks of Sydney, Australia's biggest city. Sites the detainees and Manus have been told they will never see. It's this lifestyle and the freedoms of Australia which have attracted people from all over the world to settle here. People like Amir. He left Iran in 2009 during a violent government crackdown on activists. I left Iran because we didn't have freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, especially political freedom. Amir and his family had a visa to come here. They are among the 190,000 skilled workers and their families who settle in Australia legally each year as part of the country's migration program. Australia also accepts around 20,000 refugees on humanitarian grounds. People want to come here because it's green land for them. His brother tried to arrive by boat and is now in the offshore processing camp on Nauru. Amir, not his real name, doesn't want to be identified in case speaking to me affects his brother's attempts at gaining refugee status. My brother hoped to come to Australia and start a new life and a good life, but at the moment he trapped in Nauru. Every time he called me, I expect some bad news about their situation. Amir is desperate for a change of heart by the Australian government. But the new Australian Immigration Minister, Peter Dutton, has made it clear he is sticking to the same policy. In a statement, he said, the government will not waver on its policies, which have saved lives and restored integrity to our immigration and humanitarian programs. Anyone who comes to Australia illegally by boat, without a visa, will not be settled in Australia. We asked for an interview with Mr. Dutton. He didn't get back to us. His predecessor, Scott Morrison, declined. Human rights groups have severely criticized the policy and some Australian politicians are vocally opposed. Sarah Hansen Young is a Green Party senator who participated in the parliamentary inquiry into the Manus violence. She says the policy of offshore detention centers is wrong. They are hell holes. Um, they are designed to push the individuals locked up there to breaking point, to push them to go home. It's illegal from my perspective, which means the whole purpose of them um, as a deterrence uh, it is wrong. Uh, they're, not, they're not deterring anyone. They're just ruining people. They need to be closed. Uh, they need to be closed immediately. She believes that people should not be forced to settle on PNG. Resettlement is a joke. It, it's not going to happen. 
it won't ever be um, legitimate. As long as the Australian government pays enough money to our regional neighbours like PNG or Nauru, they'll do Australia's dirty work for them. Ben Doherty works for Guardian Australia and has been following the debate. Public opinion on Australia's offshore asylum policies is deeply divided and it is a particularly emotive and divisive issue in the Australian community. There are certainly people who are um, very strong supporters of the Immigration Minister and he's seen to be doing a very good job in that he's been able to stop the boats, which was a key election campaign promise for this government, and certainly the boats have stopped. But other people are looking more at what's happened to those people who are in Australia's care and Australia's custody in, in, in the immigration detention system. The other element, I, I suppose, is looking at Australia's international legal obligations as a signatory, as a party to the Refugees Convention. Australia is seen to be, um, by um, a, a weight of, of international legal opinion, in breach of its international legal obligations in that we are taking people from Australian care and custody and we're taking them to, to, to third countries. Uh, people are being punished um, by virtue of the, of the fact that they, they've come to this country by boat without a visa. I went out on the streets of Sydney to find out what people thought. It's obviously working because the boats have stopped. Sometimes you need a big stick and, and Europe can take a lesson from this, I, I think. I think that the current government has managed to stop the boats, but they've stopped it at a huge price, a huge price and to Australia's reputation internationally and frankly to me as a, as a new Australian that uh, illegal uh, way of trying to get here, which is uh, risking other people's lives and risking livelihoods in terms of uh, them paying pirates to try and get people over here, that's the part that I don't agree with. If you're a refugee, there is definitely ways to get over here in a, in a legal way. Some asylum seekers from Manus Island and Nauru have been allowed to come to Australia, but not as citizens or refugees. They are being held in a detention centre in Sydney. They are here to get medical and psychiatric treatment. They include some of those injured in the violence on Manus Island. Once again, cameras were not allowed, but I was able to go in as a visitor. I visited uh, at least three Iranian asylum seekers, uh, all of them from Manus Island. Mentally, they are traumatised and all of them are still taking uh, sleeping pills. All of them are uh, still um, stressed out and all of them are facing uncertainty about their future. It was sad uh, and disturbing for me, you know, to see uh, asylum seekers from my own country. Um, uh, all of them traumatized, wounded. They said, our life is changed, totally changed, especially with the uncertainty. They were quite worried to be returned to Manus Island. Meeting asylum seekers face to face brought home to me just how brutal this policy is. Australia says tough measures are needed to save lives and prevent more tragedies like our means. He is now back in Iran and deeply traumatized. با دوستای قدیمیش اصلا ارتباط نداره به خاطر اینکه می تر دوست نداره بدون این پدر مادرش و خواهرش تو این راه از دست داده از دوستای قدیمیش فراریه. خیلی بهانگی شده به خاطر پدر مادرش اینا اصلا گریه نمیکنه. ما وقتی که سر مزار میریم اصلا گریه نمیکنه. ولی خیلی متوجه دل نازکه. مثلا سر چیزایی خیلی کوچولو گریه میکنه. دیا یه سیر رفتیم دریا اصلا از ماشین پیاده نشد به اصرار خودش رفتیم ولی اصلا از ماشین پیاده نشد دوست نداشت که پیاده شه Another refugee makes his first tentative steps beyond the fence Australia insists that its pacific solution can work Australian media has been showing pictures of the first asylum seeker to move out of the detention center all eyes are on him to see if, for some people, it's really possible to start a new life in PNG.
I'm walking around here without any officers, without anything, and I am along. I hope I will be useful personnel for this, con this country. But a policy designed to save lives has shattered many others. Even the people working to implement the policy have been deeply affected. I think working at the centres has changed me completely. I mean, I, I sometimes think about what my life would be like if I didn't work there. And maybe I would have finished uni by now, maybe I'd have a nice job in Australia, I don't know. I ended up seeing a, um, a counsellor, a psychiatrist, for a short period of time. I had very vivid dreams about what I'd, I'd experienced up there. I'm now doing a double degree in counselling and social work. So what, what I was before Manus is not what I want to be afterwards. So if there's anything good that's come out of that, I'm now studying again. Who knows, maybe work within the asylum seeking community some, at some stage. I don't know what that holds, but it's driven me to, to do something better than what I was doing. Omid is still in the camp. As time goes by, he is feeling increasingly hopeless and depressed. If he goes back to Iran, he risks arrest. But he can't imagine a future for himself in PNG. He never imagined his Australian dream would end this way. I'm not going to be able to get the money. I'm not going to be able to get the money. I'm not going to be able to get the money. I'm not going to be able to get the money. I'm not going to be able to get the money. I'm not going to be able to get the money. I'm not going to be able to get the money. I'm not going to be able to